Hello, welcome back to the next of our full course lectures. This lecture is on IAS 19, Employee Benefits. Really, pensions is what we're looking at here. This standard has been recently updated, so the requirements that we're going to outline here are the updated requirements. So we also have a lecture on there showing the old requirements so that you can compare and contrast the two. So, what are we talking about with pensions? Well, two types that you need to be aware of, first of all. A defined contribution scheme. This is where a fixed amount is paid in by both the business and by the employee. So they pay an amount into the pension, and then what's left at the end of the term is what's paid out. So there's no liability created by the business. They simply have whatever's paid in, the person then takes out at the end. As opposed to a defined benefit scheme. This is where a fixed amount is going to be paid out. And that might be a percentage of their final salary, for example. So their defined benefit means that you're going to get an amount out rather than pay an amount in. So that means that at the end of the term, there may be a deficit or a surplus on that scheme. And if there's a deficit, well then the business is going to have to make good that deficit. So therefore, there's going to be a liability created by the business for that pension. So it's the same definition of a liability as provisions, so a legal or a constructive responsibility to fulfill that deficit. So that would create a liability and the business will then have to make good any of the pension payments that are going to be made to the employees that couldn't be made out of the amount within the pension fund. So those are the two different types. Defined contribution, an amount is paid in, then whatever is left at the end is paid out to the pensioner. A defined benefit scheme, well, that says how much is going to be paid out of the scheme. Hopefully there'll be enough to pay that out. If there's not enough to pay it out, well then the business is going to have to make that good. It's going to have to make up the difference. So let's look at the different treatments for this. First of all, for a defined contribution scheme. Well, defined contribution scheme is really straightforward. The company pays an amount in each year. That amount is expensed in the period and that's it done. So it's an expense, a pension expense in the period, nothing more than that because they don't have any ongoing uh, responsibility to make good any of the payments. So the defined contribution scheme, the company pays an amount in, that amount is expensed in the year, that's it. The complication comes in with defined benefit schemes because remember these can create a big liability for the company. Because if there's not enough in the pension fund, the company will have to make that amount good. So what we need to do is assess the different areas. The different areas of the financial statements that we'll have for a defined benefit scheme. Well, on the balance sheet, first of all, we'll have pension assets because when the contributions are made, those contributions will be invested by the pension fund. They'll be invested in assets such as property, shares, bonds, all sorts of assets. So those will appear on the balance sheet of the company. There'll also be a pension liability because the present value of the future payments that we have to make out to the um, pensioners will make up the liability. So all the future payments that we're likely to have to pay out on the scheme, discounted to today's value, will be the pension liabilities. Now on the balance sheet, those will net out on one line to be a net pension asset or a net pension liability. So pension assets, pension liabilities will appear on the balance sheet and those net out on one line. In the income statement then, we have a charge in the year. First of all, we'll have the service costs. So we'll look in detail at what those are, but we'll have service costs in the year, which will be the amounts that are paid into the scheme, for example. But we'll also have interest costs. So there'll be a return generated on the assets and we'll unwind the discount on the liabilities, those will create interest costs. So we're going to show those separately on the income statement, and we'll show you that whenever we go through an example. Lastly, in the statement of comprehensive income, we may have some unrealized gains and losses on our assets and liabilities. Now, I'll show you how those arise, but if we have these unrealized gains and losses in the period, they'll be called the remeasurement component of the pension liability, and those will go through the statement of comprehensive income. So unrealized gains and losses on the assets and the liabilities in the pension 
will be remeasured through the statement of comprehensive income. And I'll show you how to do that when we look at an example. So on the balance sheet, we have the net pension asset and liability. We've got the income statement service costs and interest costs. And on the statement of comprehensive income, we're going to have some unrealized gains and losses. And I'll show you how those come about. So it's useful if you know what's actually happening with the defined benefit scheme. So what actually happens is that each year the company employs an actuary. Now an actuary is someone who comes in and estimates, for example, how much you're going to have to pay out on your pension scheme in the future. Now that will be based on the expected lives of the employees and the expected working lives of the employees. So the company will come in, employ that actuary to do various things. They'll value the assets within the pension funds, they'll calculate the liabilities, and they'll also look at the return on the assets and the discount rate that should be applied to the liabilities. Now, we now use the same discount rate. That discount rate will be the discount rate on good quality corporate bonds, just so you're aware of that. But usually they'll give you that discount rate in the question. So the treatment that we have is going to be based on the actuary's figures. Now that's important to realise because that's what creates the unrealised gains and losses. Because the opening balance will be given to us on the pension assets, for example. But also the actuary will project what the closing balance will be. If the closing balance doesn't match what the actuary said it was going to be, well that could create a gain or a loss, an unrealised gain or a loss. And that's what I'm talking about going through the statement of comprehensive income. So make sure you get that straight in your head because you'll be given these figures in the exam. You'll be given the opening balance on pension assets and you'll be given the closing balance. So you'll post anything that's in between and if there's a balance on it, there's a difference, that's going to be an unrealised gain or loss. And the same will apply to pension liabilities. So let's look at this in more detail. So the pension assets, first of all. So remember, first of all, you'll be given the assets brought forward from last year. So the pension asset will be brought forward from last year. Now, in addition to that, we'll have a return expected on these assets. So we'll use the discount rate to project what that return will be. So remember, this will be projected by the actuary. And what it's going to do is... It's going to increase our assets because we'll get a return on the assets. So it might be dividend income. It might be an expected increase in the value of the assets. So it'll increase the value of the assets in our pension scheme. And the other side of that, the credit will go to the income statement. So we increase the assets with the debit and the credit goes to the income statement. So let's look at illustration one on this. In illustration one, we're calculating the return on plan assets. So this is very simple and straightforward. We simply take the pension assets brought forward. In this case, it's 1,000. We take the expected return on the pension assets, which is 11%, and we multiply the two together. So the expected return on the plan assets is 110. So that's how we do the calculation for our expected return on plan assets. Just make sure that you pick up the right percentage and that you apply it to the plan assets brought forward, not the closing balance on your pension assets. Now that we've looked at illustration one and we know what the return on the assets is and the treatment for it, let's start to build up what we know so far. So I'm gonna use a table to do that. And this is the same table that we're gonna be able to use to do our pension calculations. So I'm going to look at this table and state what we've done so far and how it fits into the table. So let's set up our table to see what we know so far. So we need to set up a table with the four different areas of the financial statements that are going to be affected by the pensions. So we have the income statement. There's going to be an income statement charge for pensions. There's also going to be the pension assets. There's going to be our unrecognized gains and losses that are going to go through our statement of comprehensive income. And there's going to be pension liabilities. Remember, the pension assets and the pension liabilities net out on the balance sheet to form a net pension asset or a net pension liability. 
We'll also be given in the question our brought forward balances. Of course, there won't be any on the income statement. There'll be a brought forward balance given to us in the question on the pension assets. Uh, there won't be any for the statement of comprehensive income, of course. And there will be the brought forward balance given to us on the pension liabilities. Don't forget also that we'll be given the balance carried forward. That's given to us by the actuary. So that will be given to us in the question for both the pension assets and the pension liabilities. So we'll have the brought forward balances on the pension assets and the pension liabilities. And we'll have the balance carried forward given to us in the question for the pension assets and the pension liabilities. That's because the actuary projects that amount. So the first entry that we've looked at is the expected return on the assets. And remember we said that that's going to be a credit to the income statement and a debit to increase the pension assets. So the return on assets obviously increases the value of the assets and the credit to that goes to the income statement. So that's the first entry we need to learn. The next entry that we can have in our pension assets account is the company contributions. So the company contributions, I want you to remember this is the only one with the cash flow. So this is the amount that's paid in by the company into the pension fund in the year. So in the year, the company makes contributions on behalf of the employees, and those are a cash flow. So it's the only one-sided entry. It's debiting our assets to increase them, and credit will be to the cash paid. Now that doesn't appear in any of our pension um, balances, but do remember that when you come to a cash flow statement. Company contributions are a cash flow, they increase the assets, and they are a cash amount. So remember that for your cash flow statement. So let's see how that fits into our table that we're building up. The next entry in our table then is the company contributions that we've mentioned. Remember, as we've just stated, these are the only cash flow so there will be a debit to the pension assets to increase the assets and the credit will be a cash flow. So the credit will be to cash. The next entry we will have are benefits paid out. Benefits paid out, well, that's amounts that we pay out during the year on the pension fund. Of course, these will reduce our assets because we'll have to pay them out of our assets, but they'll also reduce our liabilities because it's an amount that we've paid we don't have to pay it again, so it'll reduce the future liabilities of the pension fund. So benefits paid out reduce the assets, so the credit goes to assets, and it reduces the liabilities, the debit goes to liabilities. So again, let's fill this into our table. Showing the benefits paid out on our table then, remember, is going to decrease our assets because we paid out some of those assets, but it's also going to decrease our liabilities because we won't have to pay those in the future. So it'll credit the assets and debit the liabilities. Remember that the closing balance then will be given to us by the actuary. So they'll project the closing balance on our pension assets. So the actuary gives us that closing balance. But if we add up all the entries we've got, it may well not add to the closing balance that the actuary projected. So if there is a difference, if there's a difference between what all of our entries, our opening balance, plus the debits and credits that we've done so far, if those don't add up to the closing balance, well then that's gonna be something called unrealized gains or losses. So we're gonna have a gain or a loss on our pension assets, depending on whether that's a debit or a credit. So let's see how that fits into our table. So as we can see in our table, the balance carried forward on the pension assets is given to us in the question. That's because the actuary will project that. So if our debits and credits don't add up to the balance carried forward, there'll be a difference. That will be unrecognized gains or losses in the period on pension assets. So the balancing figure will go in there. So it'll be an unrecognized gain or an unrecognized loss in that period. Now that we've looked at our pension asset, we need to move on to look at our pension liability. Remember again, the liabilities brought forward from last year will be given to us, 
And remember, they're made up of the present value of all future payments likely to be made on the pension. So the actuary will predict how much we're going to have to pay out on the pension. And that will be discounted because it's going to be paid in the future. So the liabilities are the present value of all future payments on the um, pension liabilities. So unwinding the discount is the first thing we're going to have to do. Each year we're going to have an interest cost because we need to unwind that discount. Remember the liabilities are the present value of all future payments but each year that passes takes us a year closer to having to pay those liabilities. So in the year we need to unwind the discount. That's called an interest cost. It's going to increase our liabilities and it's going to go to the income statement on the other side. So we increase our liabilities with the credit and the debit goes to our income statement. So let's see how this works. Let's see how to calculate it in illustration two. Illustration two deals with the discounting of our pension liabilities and the unwinding of that discount. So what we do is we take the pension liabilities brought forward. In this illustration, they are 1,400. And we unwind the discount. The discount rate was 12%. So the interest cost or the unwinding of that discount is the 1,400 times 12%, which is 168. So the interest cost for illustration two is 168. Again, now that we see how to calculate our interest cost, let's put it into our table and see how that builds it up. The interest cost that we now know how to calculate, well, remember the first part of it is going to increase our liabilities. So we've got to increase our liabilities because we're one year closer to having to pay those liabilities. So we're unwinding the discount on them. The other side of that will be a debit to the income statement. So we credit our liabilities and we debit the income statement with our interest cost on pension liabilities. The next entry to look at in the liabilities is the service cost. So the service cost is new liabilities created from the year. Obviously our workers are going to have worked for us for another year. That's going to have built up more pension liability because we'll have to pay them out more on the basis of that year that they've worked. Now there are two different types. It could be current service costs or there could be past service costs. Past service costs would arise if, for example, there were changes to the pension scheme. So changes to how the pension scheme eventually is going to pay out, for example. It doesn't matter whether they're current or past service costs, they're going to be treated in the same way. They're going to be treated by increasing the liabilities because they're new liabilities from the year. So we credit liabilities and we debit the income statement with the other side. So let's see how that's dealt with in our table. Our service costs, well, those will first of all be an increase to our pension liabilities because remember, this is new liabilities created for the year. So our service costs will first of all increase our liabilities and secondly, the debit will be to the income statement. So we increase the liabilities and debit the income statement with service costs, whether past, present, whatever they happen to be. The next entry we will have is our benefits paid out. Remember, we've already mentioned this when we looked at assets. That's because it affects both the liabilities and the assets. It reduces the liabilities and it reduces the assets because we've paid out benefits in the year from the assets and we won't have to pay those again, so we reduce the liabilities. And we've already dealt with that in our table. The closing balance on the liabilities then, remember, is given to us by the actuary. And if all of our entries don't add up to the closing balance, so our opening balance plus the debits and credits that we've put through, if they don't add up to the closing balance given to us by the actuary, well then the difference will be unrealized gains or losses. So let's see how to deal with those then. So our unrealized gains and losses, let's put them into our table and then we'll look at how exactly we treat them. So we can now finish off our table with the difference on our pension liabilities, remember? 
So it will be an unrecognized gain or loss in the period. So remember, the balance carried forward is given to us in the question. If our opening balance plus and minus our debits and credits don't add up to the balance carried forward, well then we'll have a balancing figure. So the balancing figure on our pension liabilities will be an unrecognized gain or loss. The balancing figure in our pension assets will be an unrecognized gain or loss. Both of those will go through the statement of comprehensive income. So the corresponding debit or credit to each of our gains or losses on pension assets and liabilities will go through other comprehensive income. So there'll be a net debit or credit gain or loss going through other comprehensive income. So at the end, all we need to do is add up our income statement amounts and add up the amount going to other comprehensive income to know what we need to put in our financial statements. So we'll look at a detailed example of this in a second, just to show you exactly how to do this on a question. So thinking about those gains and losses that we've just talked about, we know that the difference on the pension assets and the difference on the pension liabilities will create unrealized gains and losses. What do we do with them? Well, as we've mentioned, we're going to recognize those in equity. That means they'll be shown in the statement of comprehensive income and they'll then be creating a reserve in equity. So we're going to recognize those gains and losses in equity through our statement of comprehensive income. Just be aware that this is a change. There used to be three different ways that we could recognize unrecognized gains and losses. We could do them through um, the income statement in full. We could do them through the statement of other comprehensive income in full, as we have to do now. Or there was a complicated method called the 10% corridor for recognizing some of those gains and losses each year. Those methods have now all been amalgamated into one. So we only have one method for recognizing those gains and losses. It's through our statement of comprehensive income and into reserves. So we don't have a 10% corridor and we don't recognize them in the income statement. So let's summarize this and then let's do an illustration. I want to show you an easy way to remember how to do these pension calculations. So we're going to use Paul T. Pensioner for our IAS 19 calculations. So what are we talking about here? Paul T. So we've got our pensioner, Paul T. And there's his cup of tea. Okay, that's to remind us that we need four T accounts. We need four accounts here. We need a profit and loss account, P. We need an assets account, A. We need an unrecognized account. That's the amount that's going to go through our statement of comprehensive income. And we need a liabilities account, L. So with our cup of tea, Paul T. Pensioner likes to have a biscuit. So that's how we're going to remember the things that go into our accounts biscuit. So first of all, we have the brought forward balance. Remember that that will be given to you in the question for the assets and the liabilities. B then is for the benefits paid out. So benefits paid out are a credit to the assets, a debit to the liabilities because they decrease both. I is for the interest cost. So remember that's unwinding the discount on the liabilities. So it increases our liabilities and the debit goes to the income statement. So credit, liabilities, debit, profit and loss. S is for service costs. Remember, increased liabilities through workers working for another year. So we credit liabilities, debit the income statement. C is for the contributions, our only one-sided entry. So it's a debit to the assets. But remember, for your cash flow statement, that the other side is to cash U is for our unrecognized gains and losses. So that will be the balancing figure on our assets, the balancing figure on our liabilities, both the brought in to go through our statement of comprehensive income. So the net amount to go through the statement of comprehensive income. I is for the increase in assets. So that's the return that we get on the assets. So we debit the assets to increase them and credit, credit the profit and loss. T is for the totals at the year end. Remember that the assets total will be given to you in the question. The liabilities total will be given to you in the question. And you need to add up the profit and loss account and add up statement of comprehensive income to see the amounts going through there.
We can now use all of this to look at our illustration. So when we see an illustration, what we need to do for pensions is first of all, calculate the expected return on the assets and the unwinding of the discount on the liabilities. So first of all, the expected return on the assets. Well, we're told that the discount rate is 12% and the opening balance on the assets is 1800. So we expect to get a 12% return on the opening balance of 1800. So 1800 times 12% gives us 216. We now need to look at our discount rate for our liabilities. So the interest cost will be the unwinding of the discount on the liabilities. So our working will be 12% again times 1600 of the opening balance on liabilities gives us 192. So 1600 was the opening balance on liabilities. We're going to multiply that by the discount rate which is 12%, so that gives us 192. So we can now go ahead and fill this into our table to get all of the information that we need for the financial statements. So our four accounts were our Paul accounts, P, A, U and L. So bringing that into our table with our biscuit analogy. So the broad forward balances we're given as 1800 and 1600 on our assets and our liabilities. B is for our benefits paid. So our benefits paid out in the year were 100. So those decrease the assets and they decrease the liabilities. Now what we're doing is we're showing the liabilities as a credit balance, so they're negative. So if we're debiting, we're gonna use a positive, And if we're crediting, we're gonna use a negative. So the debit balance brought forward on assets is positive. The credit balance brought forward on liabilities is negative. So the credit to assets to reduce it is 100. The debit to liabilities, which will also reduce that, is 100. I then is for our interest cost that we calculated. So we're crediting the liabilities, so that's negative 192. And the debit goes to the income statement 192. S is for the service costs. So they had two service costs, 35 and 70. Add those together and we get 105. So the credit again is to the liabilities, so that's gonna be a negative. And the debit is to the service costs in the profit and loss, and that's 105, and that's gonna be positive. C is for our contributions, and they are a debit to the assets. So they're a positive 90 to the assets. Remember, there's no other side to that entry in our calculations here, but if it was a cash flow statement, we'd need to remember those, because they're a cash flow. Unrecognised, I'll come to in a second, we need the increase in assets, 216, that's what we calculated, our expected return on assets, which were minus 216 to the profit and loss, and the debit to the assets. Our total at the year end was brought forward 2,700 on the assets, 2,100 on liabilities. So looking back to the unrecognised amount, so our 1,800 less 100 plus 90, plus 216 didn't add up to 2,700. We had an unrecognized amount of 694. So an unrecognized amount of 694. So also on our liabilities, the 1,600 brought forward, plus the 100, less the 192, less the 105, did not add up to the closing balance of 2,100. So there was 303 of a credit entry required. So the net amount of our 694 and our 303, so for our assets, we've debited assets with 694, credited unrecognized gains 694. We have credited liabilities with 303 and debited unrecognized gains with 303. The net of those is 391. So 694 of a credit less 303 of a debit gives us 391 of a credit to unrecognized gains. So we've got an unrecognized gain of 391. Also then adding up the profit and loss account, we get 81. Now we'll separate that out to show it separately in our income statement, but I'll show you how to do that now. So what we do is we fill all the elements in. If we have a balancing figure on our assets and liabilities, it'll be our unrecognized gains or losses. The net amount of our unrecognized gains and losses on assets and liabilities goes through the statement of comprehensive income. 
and it was 391 in this instance. So what we're going to do is in our income statement, we're going to split up our charge. We had service costs of 105 and we had the net interest of the expected return on assets and the unwinding of the discount on liabilities of 24. So that gave us a figure for the profit and loss account of 81. Okay, so we had an expense in the year of 81. So it's made up of the service costs and the net interest charge. In other comprehensive income, we had our net remeasurement component. That's our unrecognized gains and losses, 391. So that was the net amount of our unrecognized gains and losses on our assets and our liabilities. And in the statement of financial position, we have a net pension asset if it's recoverable. I'll talk about that later in the lecture. So the net pension asset was 2,700 of an asset less 2,100 of a liability, leaving us a net pension asset of 600. So that's how we do the calculations for our pensions. Just fill everything into your table, balance off your unrecognized gains and losses. The net amount from those will go through other comprehensive income. And then separate out your service costs and your net interest for the income statement. Your other comprehensive income will be those unrecognized gains and losses. And the statement of financial position will be the net pension asset or liability. Hopefully now you can see that if you learn that table and you learn how to post all of those entries, you should be able to do a pensions question reasonably easily. The one last thing I want to mention is called the asset ceiling. So if there is a pension asset created, so if it's a net pension asset, so the net of our pension assets and our pension liabilities creates a net pension asset. Well, remember that that will only be recognized if it is recoverable. So do we have the right to the net pension asset if it was to occur? So if all of the scheme was paid out and there was a net amount left, would the company get that amount or would it be um, given out to the employees or perhaps taken by the pension company? If it would be recognized and recovered, so if we could actually recover that amount, well then we would recognize that pension asset. So we only recognize a pension asset to the extent that it is recoverable. And remember, this is back to the conceptual framework. You can't recognize an asset if you're unlikely to recover it. So we only recognize a pension asset if it is recoverable. So the question approach. Well, the first thing to do is to set up your table. So you'll need an account for your assets, for your liabilities, for your unrecognized gains and losses to go through statement of comprehensive income, and for your income statement for the charge in the year for the service cost and the net interest cost. You're then gonna calculate the two things that we need to do, the return on the assets and the interest cost on the liabilities. Then simply post the journals, balance it off, and say what the net pension asset is, how much goes to the income statement, and what the amount to go through the statement of comprehensive income is. So if you follow that question approach, you should be able to deal with any pension questions. So that was our lecture on the updated IAS 19.